What's up guys, Chris here. Uh, today I want to talk a little bit about the Tormach machine that I bought uh, nearly a year ago now. The way I looked at it was this. Do I want a new machine with a warranty, with service, readily available parts that are cheap and easy to get, or do I want to take my chances with a used machine uh, and may not be able to get parts for it, or uh, the parts might be hard to come by or very expensive. Um, no real warranty or support with any of those. And actually the Lagoon over there is a good example of why I didn't want to go with a used machine. A while back I was getting an operating system not found error. Uh, it turns out it was just the CMOS battery, but had it been something like a fried motherboard or a bad port or something like that, I don't think I would have been able to replace it, even if I wanted to. Uh, more recently though, the X-axis has started to act up. Um, as I use it, it'll just rapidly shoot off to the, to the positive X direction until it hits a limit switch. It's kind of a moot point now because as of a few weeks ago when I powered it on to do some face milling, it just plain wouldn't move at all. It's little issues like that that suck up a ton of time and money trying to track down. Um, and that's all time where you're doing something that's not making you money. Instead, just you know, doing maintenance on your machines. But anyway, onto the Tormach, and uh, the reason why I chose that, um, it's got warranty, it's got support, but most of all, the parts are cheap. The replacement X-axis motor for this was like $350 for uh, the average Haas. I think they were about, it was like $1,500 to $3,000 spindle on this. It's about $600. Spindle on a Haas, it's about $6,000. Now I realize that's not, you know, an apples to apples comparison. I, um... <laughs> $6,000 Haas spindle is completely different than a $600 Tormach spindle, but the bottom line is you need both of them to run either machine. So if, if your machine stops working, you have no choice but to replace that part or stop making parts. Uh, other advantages, it's 220 volts, no three phase. Uh, it's small and lightweight. It can fit in a garage really easily. Something like the, the Haas Mini Mill, uh, I think would be about the next size up machine is a full foot taller than my ceilings will allow. Another issue is these are being relatively lightweight. They don't need, well, I don't even know if they even have any slab requirements um, like the big machines do, but my concrete in here is thin and terrible. Uh, it's already got quite a few large cracks in it and settling issues, and putting a, a large machine in here would just be a bad idea. Uh, it's also fairly accurate for the price. I don't have any real problems holding, you know, a thousandth or maybe two um, on any any given parts. Uh, I actually did a run not too long ago, and they were all consistently a thousandth or less. It's certainly not as good as it could be, but ultimately, it's it's pretty good for the price. So, does that mean I love it? Uh, not really. So, being realistic, it's never going to perform like a real machining center. But there are definitely some shortcomings that I, some that I was expecting and some that I wasn't expecting. First thing I found out not too long ago, not all of the Tormox are actually completely inspected at the factory. One out of 20 Tormox is checked for at least positioning error and uh, milling performance, and if it passes then all the machines in that batch will pass as well, which means some things can get overlooked and, and shipped out to people, and I know there have been plenty of reports of people who've had accuracy issues and stuff like that with their machines. Uh, it's kind of luck of the draw that way. I got pretty lucky. Mine is nice and tight, but uh, I know there's some others that, that weren't. And in addition, their tolerances for what constitutes an acceptable machine are a little generous. Um, things like uh, perpendicularity in X or Y, I forget what it is, uh, X probably both, it is about one and a half thousandths over about eight inches, which is, so having that kind of potential for accuracy is a little bit scary. But uh, actual problems that I've had, uh, the flood coolant was probably the most disappointing thing with with this to begin with, and I kind of knew that. I mean, everybody upgrades their, their coolant systems. I guess it depends what you want out of your flood coolant if you want chip evacuation or if you just want wet parts. Um, I upgraded mine um, with a much larger uh, reservoir tank and a much larger pump and a filter which they didn't have at all from the factory. You would end up with chips that clog up your nozzles and then coolants not coming out and it was just it was a mess. So I replaced all that 
I'm much happier with it now. But along with the flood coolant, um, the other thing I ran into was this thing leaks like crazy. Uh, maybe not so much with the, the factory drip coolant, but uh, I think I went through three iterations of trying to waterproof this thing before I just broke down and epoxy the entire thing together. I tried silicone, I tried flex seal, I tried um, obviously the, this rubber caulk tape stuff that they ship with, but every time I'd, uh, I'd let the machine run for a little while and I'd come back and there'd be puddles of coolant on the floor, uh, all of the cabinets underneath the enclosure were full of coolant, uh, the computer was sitting in coolant multiple times. So that was a, that was a pretty big issue that i um, not too happy with, but it's, it's sealed up now, uh, except when the chip strainer gets full of uh, chips. It will, it will fill up to the point that it, it just finds a hole and leaks out and I get coolant all over the place. Uh, next up is the spindle design. It uses these TTS collets in a uh, R8, standard R8, well, modified standard R8 collet. And if you're familiar with the R8 system, you know there's, uh, there's a little pin in there that, that keeps the collet from wanting to uh, loosen its way off the drawbar. Uh, normally that's fine, it's just there for alignment and just kind of keeps it still. The taper does the clamping um, of, the, of the collet, but in a, even a minor crash with the, the Tormach, um, especially with the Superfly, actually I think I've only had crashes with the Superfly, I think I crashed a shear hog once too. It'll produce enough torque to actually twist the collet in the taper and shear off that little pin inside. Uh, it messes up the collet, it messes up the, the spindle, obviously. Uh, the TTS tool holder can spin or will spin in the R8 collet. Uh, basically everything just gets messed up. And that's, you know, obviously my fault for letting it crash, but uh, it's also something that will happen no matter how careful you are. Um, and being able to, re to repair something like that is really important. In order to replace that pin, you have to disassemble the entire spindle, um, everything down to the ball bearings. Um, the ball bearings have to come off even. You have to be able to, to get those off and then press them back on when you're done. Uh, and if you're unfortunate like me uh, and you end up splitting one of your bearings in half and your balls go all over the place. Uh, another issue, uh, kind of expecting uh, machine rigidity. It's obviously nothing like a, a proper machining center, but I was hoping it would be a little more robust than it is. Uh, it's not a, it's not a problem per se. You just have to stay small with most of your tooling. Standard end mills, really anything beyond about three eighths in aluminum or about a half inch in steel is really pushing it. Uh, you start to get a lot of chatter and squealing and, and just general unpleasantness. So the flood coolant, the leaking, the rigidity, and the uh, spindle design were the kind of the things that I was not really expecting. What I was expecting to be let down a little bit on was uh, spindle speed and movement speed. The Tormach has a 5100 RPM spindle and can move about 100 inches per minute, I believe, X and Y, 110 and 90 on the uh, Z which for as light of cuts as you generally need to take with the machine, it's okay. But there are a lot of times, especially with the spindle speed, when you get into small diameter tools, uh, it can get absolutely brutal to, to run some things through there. I mean, hours and hours of machining time. But all that's not to say that this is a bad machine. Um, it's, a, it's a little prototyping, hobby, um, low production machine. Uh, it is what it is. Um, it costs a fraction of what the, the big machines cost. Um, it's, it's cheap and easy to repair, and it will get, you, get the job done. It's just a matter of how fast it will get that job done and what kind of compromises you need to make to use this machine and then worry about things like post-processing and, and maybe cleaning up finishes and, and stuff like that um, that you might not have to do on something like an Okuma or a Moriseki. But uh, yeah, it's, I've made plenty of stuff I'm, I'm quite proud of with it. Um, Made parts in aluminum, uh, steel, titanium. Uh, there's not really anything that I've found that it can't handle. Um, you just need to be mindful of what its limitations are and program around that. Like I said, it's gotten me uh, to the point that I'm doing this full time now, um, which is something I wouldn't be able to do if I didn't have the Tormach and there was really no option for me to get anything else. So if I could go back and do it again, would I? Yeah, I would. Um, 
I'd be a little less enthusiastic about it. But here's the thing: there's just there's nothing else that will work for me for where I'm at right now. Um, even the smallest Haas mini mill won't physically fit in the garage, uh, even if I could get power for it, and even if I did have a nice thick slab. Um, not to mention that machine is is about uh, almost twice the price of one of these. And so this is where the business side of things come into play. Uh, there's nothing at all wrong with spending the money on a, on a big, heavy machine. If you can bring in enough money to pay for it, then great. For now, my business just isn't at that level. A lot of what I do is prototyping and smaller run work. So if I had, you know, if I had spent three or four times the amount of money on a Haas, I'd get all my parts done in the first hour or two in the day, and then the machine would just sit there idle for the rest of the time while I'm working on designs or whatever else it might be. And that's where the Tormox make a lot of sense. Uh, it might take two or three hours to do something that might take 20 minutes to do on a Haas, but I can be off doing other stuff while it's doing that, and so it works out. Does it mean it's not frustrating when there's a little burst of activity and I need to rush some parts through? Of course not. Um, there are plenty of times where I'm just sitting here staring at this thing, wishing it could go faster. But I've rambled on long enough. Uh, the bottom line is the, the Tormach made sense for me. It still does. Uh, I don't think it will make sense for me long... Well, I know it won't make sense for me long term. Uh, hopefully it won't make sense for me in short term. For now, it works for what I'm doing. But the way I see it, as long as you're making cool shit, and you're not losing money on the deal, uh, and your machine's working the way you need it to work for you, you're doing something right.